Okay. Like that. Yeah, zoomed. That's perfect. Okay, and we're rolling. Oh, no, we're not. <laughs> And we're rolling. Hi, I'm Rachel Leah. Hi, Hi Rachel, Rachel Leah. So to start my speech, I'm going to ask you guys to do a little exercise with me. So I'm going to have everyone take their right hand and tap their head. And then at the same time, take your left hand and rub it counterclockwise around your stomach. And then while you're doing this, tap your right foot, close your left eye, and stick out your tongue. Can anyone? So you guys are pretty good. Well, it's pretty hard, right? You can't do it all. And in the midst of our busy lives, doing all of these things at the same time is pretty hard. There aren't enough seconds in the day, enough days in the year, and enough years to get everything done that you want to. And so that's why I'm here today to tell you about my personal commitment, which is focusing on a single task at one time. Think about it. If you guys were doing that while walking down the street, you could have been hit by a car, someone could have stolen your wallet, and most of all, someone could have called you for help, and you wouldn't have been able to help them. So I know this will be important to you because we all get really busy in our everyday lives, and just slowing down can help you live a healthier, healthier, and safer life. So the first reason that I'm personally committed to focusing on a single task at one time goes back to high school. I was friends with that it girl who, you know, everyone knew, everyone liked, and I was that shy, awkward sophomore that wanted to be best friends with her. And she kind of had this sketchy boyfriend that did a lot of business deals in a really bad part of downtown where I was from in Boston. And she didn't have a GPS, so one day she asked me, hey, like, could you help me go downtown, I'll follow you with my car, and then you can go back while I pick him up. I said, sure, of course. So I led her downtown, and on my way back, rain started pounding on my car. I couldn't see anything. I was a sophomore in high school. I just got my license. And she starts calling me because she's also lost. She doesn't have her GPS. My parents are calling and texting me because they're freaking out. It's 1230. I'm still not home. I'm listening to the radio because I'm super anxious. I don't know where I am. And I look down at my phone to receive a call from my parents. And a split second later, I'm hit by a car. 30 miles per hour in the center of an intersection. I have no idea where I am. My car does a full 360 and I hit a huge utility pole. Now I was super lucky that I only came out of this accident with a few bruises and a concussion, but I can tell you that when I walked out of that car and my whole body was shaking, I realized I should not have been doing all of those things at once. I couldn't tell you what direction I was coming from. I couldn't tell you where I was going and I couldn't even tell you where I was. I remember this feeling and I vowed from that day that I'd be personally committed to only focusing on a single task at one time to be safer. Now the second reason I'm personally committed to focusing on a single task at one time is seeing someone else in my family trying to do it all and it taking a toll on her body. My mom is one of the most brilliant and loving people in the world and she tried to do it all for almost as long as I can remember. She cooked our house, she cleaned our house, she worked a 40 hour work week, she took care of my younger brother. She drove me and my brother wherever we needed to go. And after a while, this started to take a toll on her body. At first, it turned into simple neck pains. And soon, those neck pains turned into severe, sharp neck pains. And soon, she was in and out of the ER almost every day, crying and seeing every therapist possible, getting cortisone shots. She ended up having to quit her full-time job. She ended up having to um, not be able to take care of my younger brother and hire a full-time nanny. And what I realized from seeing her in so much pain and not being able to do anything after doing it all was that you just can't do it all. It takes a toll on your body. It's not good for your health. It's not good for your happiness. She wasn't happy anymore. She was crying every day. And, and just seeing her in that much pain made me realize that she just needed a little bit of help and that it's okay to ask for help sometimes. You don't have to do it all. And so from these two experiences, I've taken three actions that I'm going to share with you about why I'm personally committed to focusing on this one or two things at a time instead of focusing on everything. First, I don't text and drive, and I don't use my phone while I drive. It's not safe, and you can be killed, and it's really not worth a life. That call can wait. It can wait 10 minutes. The second thing I've done is I've reevaluated my life, and I only sign up for things that I know I can take on. Currently, I'm doing an 18-hour-a-week internship on top of a job, on top of school, and I'm realizing that I'm running myself ragged, just as my mom was. So I've taken a step back, I've given my two weeks notice at my internship, and I've realized that by focusing on just a job and just on school, that I can actually excel at these few things instead of just trying to do it all. And third, 
I don't feel like I have to be everybody's best friend. I can tell people no, and I can tell people that I'm busy, and I don't have to make commitments to everything. People will understand, and in doing so, I'll be happier in the few decisions that I do make. So there should be no doubt in this room that I'm personally committed to focusing on one or two single tasks at a time. And so now I'd like you guys to repeat the exercise with me. So take your right hand and tap your head, and close your left eye. See, that was a lot easier. It didn't take a lot of thinking. And most of you were smiling because you didn't have to focus on a million things. So whether it's driving or just your everyday life, focusing on a few things can make you live a happier, healthier, and safer life. Thank you. 5.14. Let's start over here. your speech as everyone yeah everyone seems to uh, like your speech as well and uh, one thing I liked is that you had great volume you know you wanted to be heard and you got that objective done and your stories are also uh, I really liked your stories they were very personal and and uh, very descriptive as well I felt like I was there and I felt like I was in your mind and what you were going through mm -hmm. improvement hi Angela hi Angela I really like your and there's nothing much for me to like pick up, but maybe you could slow down a bit. But mm -hmm. I think it was okay. <laughs> it was like, really like okay. Just something to remember. You have an international audience. Um, <laughs> so edit a little, and then you can bury the pace. Rachel Lee, as you like to call yourself. Um, <laughs> what's my name? Um, <laughs> I liked your intro, I liked your topic, I liked your enthusiasm. You really filled the room with your energy and that was excellent. And I'd like to see more people do that, really come in with enthusiasm because it's contagious and it was good. Uh, your setup, your SIG statement was good. Um, some of the details that you to told about uh, the Middle Eastern boyfriend who was selling drugs in East Boston or something. I don't know how important those details were to you hitting a power pole and multitasking. I thought you were going to get busted for a uh, drug uh, <laughs> mule and, and uh, then it just turned out to be a plain old accident. But uh, it still was good storytelling and uh, a good example of what can happen when you're multitasking and young and you're in the rain and it's scary. Uh, your second story about your mother multitasking herself into the nearly into the grave was good and getting a nanny and so forth. That was good evidence and good storytelling. Can't criticize you there. Your um, actions were consistent with your PC. They were all good. You left off and how I feel when I take these actions. So don't, remember folks, don't skip that fourth step and how I feel better, I feel calm, relaxed, I feel more like I'm living a life that's better. And your tie back with having your audience participate was excellent and you did it in 514. Your goal was to do it within time, to move three times and have an organized layout, how to go. I think it went well. I kept it timed by a second, so that was good. Mm -hmm. I think I was a lot more organized than I've been in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think that structuring my outline like I did there yeah. helped me. And I'm, I missed, the, I wrote the feeling thing and I, it just yeah. went out. Don't, don't, don't exclude <laughs> it because you know, you now you know from spending a little more time with the sticky book that that emotion can be yeah. important in drawing people back in. So thank you, Rachel Leah. Okay, that will bring us to Joshua. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Josh, by the way. 
Hi, Josh. And we're she's writing away for her clear your voice for her. And we're rolling. Hi. Uh, a few months ago, uh, I had a job interview, and I thought things were going pretty well until I was asked the question, "How would you describe yourself?" And all I could say was, "Uh, for about a minute." Um, so least to say, the interview didn't just crash and burn, it exploded in a fiery inferno. <laughs> and uh, I was not only left jobless, but I was also left with a bigger uh, issue. And it was the fact that I wasn't a very expressive guy. I always like to suppress my emotions and feelings for some reason. And as a result, I kind of lost sight of who I am as a person, which seems ridiculous, but that's what it seemed like at the time. And so today I'd like to share with you my personal commitment of just simply speaking up and speaking out particularly about my thoughts and who I am as a person. And I know this will apply to you guys because we're the future generation of this world. And it's important that we learn to express our ideas in order to shape our society. And so I'd like to share with you two reasons and three actions that I've done to take my personal commitment. Uh, the first reason uh, stemmed back to my childhood. Uh, I wasn't a very popular kid. I was actually pretty weird and still think I'm weird now. Uh, but I got bullied a lot. I was always the butt of everyone's jokes. And as one kid named Andrew Hernandez, he's a short, scrawny guy who's half my size. I don't know like, I, why I wasn't bullying him. It should have been the other way around, but yeah, this kid was bullying me. So uh, I was bullied for about a couple of months, but this, uh, this bullying left a long impression, longing impression, the stigma on my mind that I was insignificant, I didn't matter, my thoughts didn't matter to anyone else. And I felt like a jack-in-the-box that didn't work, you know? Like, you know, I wanted to pop out, express who I am, but there was this lack of confidence from being bullied that just kept the lid down. And I didn't want to be that person anymore. I wanted to break away from that stigma. And being with you, being taking this class and being with you guys, being so, like, seeing you guys being so passionate about who you are and the principles that shaped you, it kind of inspired me to not be so afraid of myself, to, you know, be confident in who I am. Uh, the second reason was also back from my childhood. Uh, I moved a lot from elementary school to middle school and high school and moved to all these different schools and cities. And so I always, always tried to, so hard to fit in. I tried too hard to the point where I kind of forget who I am. I tried to toss that away and conform to other people's ideas and what they want me to be. And I remember this one situation where I was with my friends and they were talking about how lame tennis was. And I love tennis, you know, but at the time I was just like, yeah, it sucks, you know, we'd want to play tennis anyway. But I didn't stand up for myself, and that's something uh, I didn't want to do anymore. I didn't want to be living someone else's shadow. I wanted to live my own life the way I want to live it. And especially being at UCLA, uh, seeing all these clubs, you know, it's, one big, uh, it's been one of my inspirations. Uh, there's a... There's a wa underwater basket weaving club. <laughs> what the heck is that? I, I don't know, but at the same time, I can respect them because those are people who didn't care about what other people thought. They, they wanted to do underwater basket weaving, and they did it, and I respect that, and that, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be myself and not live someone else's life. And the three actions I've done to do my personal commitment was, uh, first action was to start voting. Uh, it's a small step, but it gives me voice, you know, it makes me confident in what I'm voting for and to express myself. And the second action I've done was to take a public speaking class, which is what I'm doing literally right now. <laughs> um, and the third action is to simply be more social, but at the same time to be myself. Don't, to not, you know, be another person just to fit in. And these actions have made me, it's been so exhilarating for me, you know, it's given me this confidence to... Uh, explore myself as an individual and discover who I am and be just more confident in myself in general. Uh, and in summary, I've just given you two actions, and or just kidding, two reasons and three actions about my personal commitment in speaking up and speaking out. Uh, the first reason being that uh, I want to be more confident in myself, especially being bullied for so long. And the second reason is to just not, uh, not to conform to anyone else's ideas, but just to be who I am. And in conclusion, there is no doubt in this room that I am personally committed to speaking up and speaking out. And maybe one day when I get another job interview and they ask me how to describe myself, I'll give them a better answer than, um.
439. Hi, everyone. Hi, Miriam. Hi, Miriam. Um, I, I really, really like your speech. I thought it was, I mean, there was a lot of humor. I don't know if you intended it to me, but I really like how you uh, mix this really uh, personal stories that you had with humor, and you got a really good uh, reaction from the audience. And I also, um, I really connected with your speech because it was something I feel that most of us have gone through. You know, it's something that we all think about, and the fact that you talk about it and like that you're actually doing it right now is something I guess really inspiring and it's good. Okay, thank you, Miriam. Yes, please. Hi, Karen. Hi, Hi Karen. Okay, so I have to say, your speech today is so much better than the first speech you've done, Thanks. and I really want to like point that out. Really good job. Um, I really like your personal commitment on um, being able to speak up, because most people feel afraid of doing that, which is a big cause. And I see that you're much more confident and that you've been doing your speeches more extemporaneously yeah. as that yeah. compared to before. Um, so in terms of improvement, I would say look down less because you make more eye contact with the audience. We don't bite. Yeah. And um, last thing is that you had actually 20, 30, yeah. 20 seconds, so you could have slowed down. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Well, Josh, uh, you've, you've been evolving as a speaker, and that's good. You started with a personal story that, that the entire room can relate to, and that is going out and seeking employment after college, and you get hit with these, um, you know, pop questions, these spontaneous ones that aren't in the manual, uh, what's your favorite color, you know, blah, 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 and all that, and um, so you obviously gave us an example that a lot of people could really relate to, and we could all feel for you in flunking that part of the uh, interview, so that was good. You categor derived your personal commitment as speaking up and speaking out. You had a good setup and a good personal uh, commitment and a good uh, significant statement. Your first story was being bullied by Edward Hernandez and um, you described it as you took most of the bullying, you didn't fight back, you sort of internalized it, and uh, we could sort of understand and relate to that, because that's a lot of times what people do, they just sort of suck it up and try to run away from the bullying and get, get free of it, and so that was a, helped us understand your reasoning for wanting to speak up and speak out now. Your second reason was to uh, try to fit in, and you talked about saying, yeah, tennis sucks. I thought that was funny. Um, and uh, you talked about the variety of clubs that are on the UCLA campus, and that's certainly true. On the actions that you've taken, you decided to vote, and... Um, your third action was to be more social. I think you could have had a few words to say what you've done exactly in that area, to be more social, to come out of your shell. That would have been helpful. Uh, good use of humor. Summary was good, and your tieback was good. Your goals were to not memorize the speech, to have a better plan, and to fake confidence till you make it. How'd it go? Uh, I, flow, I thought flow was pretty, it was better than last time, mm -hmm. better than that 10 second silence that I had. But uh, uh, yeah, I, didn't, I did it ex extemporaneously, and I thought I, yeah. I didn't memorize most of the speech. And, uh, at least in my mind, I thought I faked, faked didn't make it, but I'm not sure what it looks like. Yeah, you seem August. pretty confident this time, and, and it will come the more you uh, just fake it. So continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wade, respectfully at the door. Sorry, Wade. Yeah, you, no problem. So now we'll hear from Anne. 
Ram Anaya. Or I guess she just goes by Anne, right? Annie, she goes by Annie. Don't call me Annie Anaya. Annie. Like the movie. Hi, Annie. I'm swell. <clears throat> Okay, she's uh, managing attention. She's not <coughs> reading anymore, I guess. She's writing, okay. Communicating respect non-verbally, saying friendly eyes, you know, friendly center. Say your name, feel the love for your speech. Hi, everyone. My name is Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi, Anne. So, say what you mean and mean what you say. Yeah. Sounds simple enough, right? For some of us, it comes pretty naturally to speak our mind. And from listening to you guys in here doing your speeches, I feel like a lot of you, if not almost everyone, have, have, is crafting your words beautifully and speaking them really well. But for me, so taking the thoughts in here and sometimes the feelings in here and putting them into words to speak out for people to understand is not an easy thing. So today, I want to share with you my personal commitment to speaking my mind. <laughs> and I'll give you two reasons why I'm personally committed to this, and three actions I've taken to demonstrate this commitment. And even though I said that I believe a lot of you are already are really great speakers, I hope you still be able to take something away from this and that it would motivate you as developing communicators. So the first reason, um, this might sound a little weird, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I'm personally going to speaking my mind because I have confessed to someone that I like them. And, <laughs> God, the girl's in here. <laughs> so, um, my feelings were obviously not going to reciprocate, not, were not going to be reciprocated, and I knew that. So there was really no logical reason to tell them. But at the time, it just, feels like my feelings are piling up every day, every time I see him, little by little, until it felt like I just had to let him know, or else I'm going to burst, and I have to let this tension out. So one night in October, I wrote a letter, knowing that I'm probably going to stumble through my words, and I won't be able to tell him verbally, and I won't have the courage. And the next day, I caught him up, and I gave him the letter. After a few weeks, we initially met up again to talk, and I thought, this is going to be great. I'll be able to finally tell him what I feel and in person and let him know everything I wanted to say. But by the end of the conversation, it just didn't feel as cathartic as I had hoped. Words were stuck in my throat or they just weren't coming out the way I wanted them to. And there are still these pent up feelings inside that I could express. And I just keep losing my train of thought. So even though we were, we're still friends, I'm very happy about that, but in these moments in the future, I hope that I will be able to convey myself better and speak myself, speak for myself clearly, carefully, and accurately so that I wouldn't have regrets of not speaking the words I wanted to. So now for the second reason that I'm personally committed to speaking my mind is actually because I want to be a supportive friend. Throughout that entire time, and even now, when I was trying, struggling with my feelings, um, I have a friend, Kiri, who gave his shoulder for me to cry on. And no matter how late it was, past midnight, and maybe it's freezing cold, if I was feeling down, he would offer for us to meet up, and we'll probably grab like a extra cold or blanket, and we'll go somewhere quiet, and just sit down and talk. And he'll let me stumble through my words and listen. And at the same time, he would say things that Although I can't say it here, because it's just the way he speaks, but it'll make me feel like everything will be okay. Man. So I want to be able to do that for him as well, because he's also going through some troubles of his own, and I hope that I will be able to learn to use my words to get some comfort in the same way that he has done for me. Now, the three actions I've taken to demonstrate my commitment is one, I have been um, coming up to close friends and going to them to talk about my feelings, talking it out, instead of keeping it pent up and just let it bottle up inside. 
I used to just wake up in the morning and feeling something and I'd just keep it in and be drowned in them. But instead, I choose to go to friends I know who would be patient with me, who would let me talk, no matter how long it takes, and let me stumble through my words. In, in doing so, they help me build the confidence I need to speak my mind more instead of just keeping it in. Second, I have actually, last week after hearing someone reach out to their brother, I called up my own brother and finally had a real conversation with him. We are 11 years apart and somewhere along the way it's been really become really difficult to have a conversation, um, sorry, conversation with him because he's just sort of this figure on a pedestal for me, so successful and so brilliant. But I caught him up and we talked and actually talked about the confession and found out pleasant and surprised that he could relate to me and gave me some advice. So it felt like our sibling bonds was deep. Second, um, I have been trying to take my time to listen more to people because a lot of the anxiety for me speaking up is actually worrying about what I want to say. And instead, I decide that instead of worrying what I want to say and being afraid that people lose attention, I just listen, be an active listener, and just respond. Third action I've taken is, well, taking this class, honestly, is really helping out a lot. Hearing everyone share their intimate details and not being afraid to eloquently express themselves is really inspiring. Having done all these actions makes me feel really liberated. I felt like I'm making small progress, hopefully slowly and steadily in the right direction. And I feel proud with every little conversation I have that is meaningful and good and I'm deepening my connections with people. So in conclusion, there should be no doubt in this room that I'm really personally committed to speaking my mind. And as humans, we can't read each other's mind, but sometimes we can always try to say what you mean and mean what you say, and that goes a long way. Thank you. Thank you. 621, thank you for respectfully waiting outside. Hi, I'm Tiffany. Hi, Tiffany. I really like listening to your speech. Uh, I really appreciate your <coughs> ability to be vulnerable and honest, and I think that made you a really likable speaker. Um, and I also really liked your hand gestures. I don't think they were distracting at all. And I think it really helped like, with the fluidity of what you were trying to say, especially like when you didn't really know how to say it. Um, and I think, especially toward the end, your eye contact was really good in the way you moved around um, and like where you had it. Thank you, Tiffany. Yes, buddy. Hi, I'm Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Um, first of all, I think this was probably your best speech, and you did a really good job. But I think you could still work on speaking up louder, which obviously is what your speech is about, so you're working on it, which is good. And then um, I think just kind of like filling the room a little more, which I guess is still just kind of speaking up. But other than that, good job. OK. I agree with all those comments. I think they're helpful. I hope you'll take them to heart, Annie. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a difficult thing you're struggling with because it's part of your personality, right? And so, you know, if you're really trying to change in a fundamental way. Although I understand why you see a need to do this, and so that was good. It, I think it was interesting that you followed this gentleman who had a similar speech, so, but that was cool. I guess that was just coincidence. Um, let's talk about, <coughs> excuse me, your storytelling. And um, your first story of uh, unrequited love and sending a letter and getting a response in two weeks and then when the meeting came, stumbling still over your words and not being able to express anything was very poignant. And uh, I think we all really felt for you and felt for your frustration in that circumstance. So that was a good story and good evidence of your, mm, you know, inability to really fully express yourself. So that was a good story. The second uh, reason that, that you gave that you wanted to do this was you talked about your friend Kiri, is it? And you said that basically it's a one-way friendship. He listens to you and gives you support mostly. 
and you would like to reciprocate at some point and try to give him more support if you can and so that 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 seemed desirable too um i don't know how to help you overcome your overtime i think your 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 intro and your first story was a little long so they could have cut that down a bit um I didn't time, and time it, yeah. So that that you could have edited it a bit. On your actions, I think that your actions are perfect in terms of just being committed to having a friend, at least one friend on the planet that you can express your feelings to, and be committed to expressing your feelings. It's a very natural thing to do as a human being to express your feelings. It's not natural to bottle them up inside. It's very much like a snake that you keep punching down in the basket. You never know when it's going to pop out and go crazy. Um, on the call to the brother, that was a good um, resource and a good good action. And then on your uh, third action of listening more, I thought that was excellent. Your summary, your conclusion, and tie back were all fine. You wanted to make strong eye contact, have more enthusiasm and vocal variety, and move three times. How'd it go? Um, I know my voice is still... I don't project my voice, but mm -hmm. I was hoping it sounds more casual and hopefully a little bit more enthusiasm in there. And I think I moved three times. Yes, you did. Hopefully in not awkward ways. Right. Yes, and still work on being louder and projecting your voice even more. But I thought for the for the subject matter of the speech, the vulnerable nature of your speech, it was it was an interesting mix the way it came out. So it was effective. So thank you. Okay, that'll bring us to. Oh, you know my list. I do. Uh oh, someone's reading over my shoulder. Thomas Sullivan. <laughs> On deck is Harash Patel. Okay, we lost Harash. Okay, on deck is Eunice. Eunice Lee. Is Eunice Lee here? Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Thomas. Hi, Thomas. Wait a minute, Thomas. I didn't start the clock. No, I do this again. Touch. Touch. Fingerprint. <laughs> One of my favorite authors, Henry David Thoreau, once said, You must live in the present, launch yourself on every wave, and find your eternity in each moment. And I couldn't agree more with this quote. Today, I'd like to share with you my personal commitment to living in the present moment. I'll share with you two reasons why I'm personally committed to living in the present, and three actions that I've taken to demonstrate this commitment. Living in the present moment will allow you to get the most out of life. I think that if you commit to this, you'll feel more relaxed, you'll feel more energized, and you'll also feel happier. The first reason that I personally committed to living in the present moment is because I was affected by a sudden death in my family. That happened two years ago. It was actually right before college move in, and I was at home packing, and the phone rang. I saw that it was my grandma, so... I answered the phone. I assumed she'd be calling to wish me good luck at school or something, but I was wrong. She was sobbing so hard that I couldn't even understand what she was saying. And after repeating herself several times, I finally got the message. She said that um, Wayne passed away, meaning that her brother died. I didn't know him as Wayne, but as Uncle Benny, and honestly, I didn't even know him that well. But it hurt me so much to hear my grandmother upset because I'd never heard her cry before. On top of that, my father's reaction when he heard the news was something I'd never seen from him before either, his hollow-eyed stare. 
Um, I felt a sense of guilt because I didn't have the same feelings that they did since I didn't know them well. And I didn't feel like my reaction was appropriate. I also had a sense of regret because I didn't take the time to get to know him better. But I learned that life can end abruptly and that time is precious. Uncle Benny was only 50 something years old and he died from a heart attack one day without any sort of medical history. I also learned that we should live life in each moment that we're given because we never know how much time that we really have. Um, the second reason that I'm personally committed to living in the present moment is because I remember how great it felt at an event when I did just that. This past summer, I went to a Katy Perry concert, and some of you may recall that um, I have a healthy obsession over her. And my, I haven't really shared this story with anyone before, though. And I had three goals for the concert that were really simple. I wanted to get pulled on stage, get kissed by Katy Perry, and then marry her. <laughs> so, and unfortunate. Oh, I dressed up as Papa Smurf in order to get her attention, and my sister dressed up as Smurfette, and. If you don't know, Katy Perry is the voice of Smurfette. So that's why that connected. And <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't get kissed by Katy Perry and I didn't get married. But she stared at me for seven whole seconds with solid eye contact and she even pointed at me while singing. And I have photographic proof of this. <laughs> <laughs> More importantly, though, my sister and I had such a great time at the concert. I think that. For someone who can be shy and introverted at times, this event was a really big deal in my life because it showed me that if you just let go and you're able to live in the present moment and you don't worry about the past or the future and you don't care what other people think, you'll be able to bring a lot of happiness into your life. Now I'd like to share with you three actions that I've taken to demonstrate my personal commitment. Firstly, I try not to multitask anymore, which can be really difficult. But if I'm at lunch with a friend, for example, I don't also want to be on my phone texting. So doing this action where I don't multitask anymore allows me to focus more and I'm able to listen better as well because I'm not worried about focusing on so many different things at once. The second action that I've taken is that I recall everything that I'm thankful for in life. If I'm um, having a bad day, I can always list at least one positive thing, and this action keeps me less focused on the past or the future and gets me a frame of mind where I can focus on what I'm presently thankful for. Lastly, I don't sweat the small stuff. If I'm late to class, for example, I don't let that bad mood sort of define my whole day. Instead, I ignore these minor setbacks and put my energy to better use. When I performed these actions, I felt more mindful, less stressed, and happier about myself. In summary, I've shared with you two reasons why I'm personally committed to living in the present moment and three actions that I've taken to demonstrate this commitment. There should be no doubt in this room that I really am personally committed to living in the present moment. And I think that Thoreau is right. In order to get the most out of life, you must live in the present, launch yourself on every wave, and find your eternity in each moment. Thank you. Thank you. 504. <coughs> Where are we? Somewhere over here. Thank you for respectfully waiting outside. Where are we? Here? Hi, Anne. I really love your speech. I feel that you went to work. Uh, you explain your point really well. You make three times make real good eye contact and you stay in the time with it. Good job. Yeah, I really like your speech too. Start with your name. Pauline. Hi, Pauline. <laughs> um, we can see that you practiced it. it. It's really good. And it was also really funny, which is always very positive, but if I had to say something, I would say maybe value your tone a little more, but just a little okay. bit. It's a minor That's bit. good, yeah. That's good. So a little vocal variety would help, sure. There's a, a book by Baba Ramdas called Be Here Now. It was very popular some time ago that, that took Thoreau's philosophy and tried to extend it into practical exercises for staying in the now. It's a very difficult thing to stay in the now for people. People like to project ahead or worry about the past, you know, so. Um, loved your quote. 
good grammar, uh, drew people in, and good tie back to it, so good bookend, so that worked well. Your personal uh, commitment, I was worried it wasn't going to be personal enough. I was worried it was going to be more philosophical and abstract, but when you got to Katy Perry, then I knew it was going to be personal. <laughs> um, on your first story about losing Uncle Benny and your father's reaction, as you put it, hollow-eyed and you know, I remember the first time I saw my father cry. It was a real stunner for me when he lost uh, his father. I had never seen it before. I just went, wow. You know. Uh, the, uh, uh, and I like you added that the moral to the story of you sorry that you did not get to know um, him better and that sort of thing in life is very fleeting. And this. This sometimes comes when you see, when you're faced with, with the reality of death. So your first story was good and supported your thesis. On your second story, it was funny and it was personal and uh, cute, I guess. Um, and I like the way you characterize it as a healthy obsession. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what an unhealthy obsession with her would be, but I guess I can imagine. Um, and uh, so, and I'm glad that you, and I'm glad you had the imagination to dress up as Papa Smurf and your sister dressed up as a Smurfette. This all sounds very creative and fun and stuff that's in the now, much like... Um, well, the way uh, people in West Hollywood celebrate Halloween, I mean, they really take it very seriously. If you've never been there, I recommend it to go at least one time in your life to see how Halloween is really celebrated. It's, it's astounding. Um, but uh, it sounds like you got into the now of the moment of it, and that was good. Um, and you had a little... Uh, moral at the end of that story, and I like that. On your actions, you stop multitasking. You, uh, I like the way that you talked about finding at least a silver lining or one positive thing, even in a, in a negative uh, day or situation. I think that that may be your saving grace because there's, they're all one door, one door slams, another one opens. You know, you've heard that. It's true. Uh, and not sweating the small things, that has to do with keeping a perspective on things. We've heard from other members of the class of how you think about things will often determine how you react to them. And thank you very much for putting your feelings in on how you felt about your actions. Your summary or conclusion and tie back were all fine. Um, you should give equal attention to all audience members. Make sure the story is clear and complete and relax. How to go? I think it went pretty well. Uh, last time I focused more on one side of the room. Yes. And this time I made sure even if I was turned to one side that I did glance over address, there. Yeah, everybody. Mm -hmm. And then as far as relaxing, I, I think just the more times that you come up here, you eventually sort of relax. Right. Um, right. That's how it works. And then the other goal was... Relax. Story clear and complete, oh, equal attention. I think that my stories were much more complete this time. I had yeah. more details. Yeah, they were good. You did a good job. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Okay, that will bring us to... Oh, you've read my list. Okay. <laughs> you put me on deck. Oh, on deck, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see, who's after Eunice? Eunice comes Tiffany. Um, is it last name Chang? Tiffany. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany J O. No, it's not. Okay. Brianda is next then. Okay, she's managing attention. Can you how's the, the old battery doing? Oh, it looks pretty good today, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Are we losing a little of her head? Yeah. Hi, Eunice. 
Hi, Hi Eunice. Today you are you, and that is truer than true. Out of everyone alive, you are youer than you. Now, when you first hear this statement by Dr. Seuss, you get a little confused. It sounds silly, really, just a rhyme. But if you take a moment to really consider the words, nothing makes more sense. Today I want to share with you my personal commitment to being happy with who I am. And in order to demonstrate this commitment, I'll give you two reasons and three actions that I've taken. Everyone at some point in their life has had some negative self-perception of themselves. And so I know you'll be able to relate to my topic. And I hope you'll be able to walk away with a greater sense of confidence and optimism for your life. Now for the first reason for why I'm personally committed to being happy with who I am. When I was younger, I had a class three underbite. According to the dentists, or the dentists, and numerous surgeons I've seen, there was no way to fix it except for surgery, which could only happen at the age of 16. See, when I was in first grade, I was at recess, and a random little boy comes up to me, and he kind of yells at me, and he says, you look like a witch, and he just walks off. <laughs> now, when this happened, my self-confidence hit rock bottom. I became so self-conscious of my physical appearance. Everything I did, everywhere I went, it was just so difficult because I was so paranoid of how other people perceived me. And the thing is, though, when I entered high school, something changed. I entered more clubs, I talked to more people, and for the first time, I began to understand that there is a chance that people can see past my physical appearance and see me for who I am. Now, I did end up getting surgery at the age of 17, but what I came to realize from this experience is that despite this change, I was still me. I would never change that because I'm me. And I just came to regret that I had been just so unhappy with who I was for the past 10 years of my life. Now for the second reason for why I'm personally committed to being happy with who I am. Well, my first year here at college, I met a guy, my first boyfriend, and I was infatuated. I thought he was perfect, until we broke up at least. <laughs> While we were dating, what happened is that he would often ask me questions like, hey, do you know how many calories is in that? You don't need those calories. Or, <laughs> or you're eating again? You don't need to eat again. Now, at the time, we both laughed it off. He said he was kidding, and I thought it was playful teasing. But when we broke up, I began to overanalyze the situation. I began to overthink everything, and I became obsessive about my weight. Um, for four months, I went on a low-calorie diet. I consumed less than 1,000 calories a day. I worked out two to three hours to make up for those calories. And I hit a point where I lost up to 20 pounds. And I was just so unhappy during this time. I felt so helpless, and I couldn't eat what I wanted. I was just so scared of gaining weight. And I just didn't see a way out. But one day, my mom sat me down, and she asked me a question. She asked me, who are you doing this for? And I said, for me, of course. I mean, who else would I be losing this weight for? And she said to me, Eunice, if you truly care for yourself and love yourself right now, you need to stop because you're in pain. And the first step to doing that is to be happy in your own body and your own skin. This was a wake up call for me. Um, obviously, the changes didn't happen overnight, but I came to realize the importance of being able to be happy with who you are. Now, in order to demonstrate this personal commitment of mine, I've taken three actions. First, whenever I look in the mirror, I smile. Not because I'm admiring myself or anything, <laughs> but because I want to remind myself to be happy with what I see. Second, I said bye to the scale. No more obsessive weight checking, um, no more calorie counting. Now it's about trying to focus, a healthy, <coughs> focus on maintaining a healthy lifestyle. And <coughs> lastly, Instead of always forcing myself onto the treadmill first thing I wake up, now I, let, I like to just take a nice walk in the morning, just take in that fresh air, just take in the sun rays, and for that moment, I'm just so satisfied and happy. In performing these actions, I've felt a sort of release in my life. I felt, very, I felt more care, carefree and just so much more happier with myself. In summary, I've shared with you my personal commitment to being happy with who I am. I've given you two reasons for this commitment and three actions that I've taken to demonstrate it. There should be no doubt in this room that I'm truly committed to this. 
As Dr. Sue stated, today you are you, and that is truer than true. There's no one alive that's dearer than you. So please be happy with yourself, because if you can't make yourself happy, who can? Thank you. Her respectful lady outside. Got it. Hi, how you doing? Hi, I'm Trenton. Hi, Trenton. So, I really loved your speech. Um, first of all, I liked how clear you were. I understood everything that you said. Also, the way you varied your voice was very well done. With your points, you became louder and you emphasized things, but when it came to like, the more emotional or like, the softer, like the more tender things, you were like, your voice was soft. I thought that was really good. And like your emotion was evident throughout the entire piece and I felt drawn and connected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Trish. Um, hi Trish. Was, I really liked your speech. Um I thought it was really good. Uh I what I would say is that just um to have more like movements that are like more specific and, and that was really it. But you did really well. So. Okay, um, I didn't start the timer, so I guess you were five minutes. <laughs> you started with Dr. Zeus, you ended with Dr. Zeus. It was good. Uh, and many people uh, poo-poo Dr. Zeus as being a child. Blah. But uh, he really does have some very uh, adult things to say when you get past the rhyming of it. And uh, I think you're right. Um, <clears throat> this is similar to some of the other speeches we're hearing about being yourself and who am I and that sort of thing. And so that was good. Your sixth statement was excellent. Your first story I thought was your best story of being called a witch and... Um, worrying about your jaw and your physical appearance and having surgery at 17 and wearing braces and being paranoid about your mouth and all that stuff. Um, that was um, that was personal and private and something that's what I was after with this speech and that was part of the feeling authentic was sharing <coughs> sharing yourself and that was good. So I like that very much. On your second story, your ex-boyfriend, as you put it, um, who uh, decided you weren't perfect the way you were and you needed to drop a few pounds. Um, very sad story, actually. Um, those should have been real clues to tell him to hit the road earlier than you did, probably. Um, but um, those were sad things. You you're eating again? You can stop eating now. You don't need those calories, do you? Wow. Hmm. Um, and then your reaction was very personal and private, the way you went on a frenzy to drop all that weight. And then your mother intervening with a good private story and very wise mother. I like your line though, you know, just be happy in your own skin and there are people that are really happy in their own skin the way they are and you can you meet people and you just know they are. And I like that line that you had in there. On your uh, actions, uh, the smile was fine, the um, not weighing yourself every day was fine and walking not frantically, uh, you know, running on the treadmill was good. And thank you for putting in the feelings about your actions. That was good. And the summary of your conclusion and tieback were all fine. You said, be confident, fake it till you make it, watch the time. Yeah, I didn't. And vocal variety. Um, so how did it go today? Um, well, confidence-wise, I can still feel myself trembling. I don't know if it was apparent to the audience, but, mm -hmm. oh, thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I felt definitely a lot more comfortable up here today, and uh -huh. I think that had to do with, like, a lot of the practice of the time marks. I know you didn't time me, but right. when I um, timed myself with practicing, it worked out well. Yeah. So, hopefully, I don't, I mean, I would never know, but hopefully, Well, you can yeah, time yourself yeah. on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, as for vocal variety, I guess it was a little... Yeah, it was good. Yeah, you did a good job. Thank you.
And who did I say was next? Who's next? Hi, how you doing? Hi, how you? Okay. And on deck will be Patricia. Hi, my name's Brianda. Hi, Brianda. Wait. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that men are what their mothers made them. After growing up in the absence of my mother and surrounded by my three brothers and my dad, I've come to find his statement to be really true. I've witnessed firsthand the beautiful product that comes from having the presence of a mother and I've also seen the impact that being deprived of this kind of nurturing support can have on some people. Um, so today I'm going to share with you my personal commitment to being both a sister and a mom to my little brother, Fernando. I will give you two reasons why I feel really strongly about this and the three actions that I've taken to ensure that he feels supported and loved at all times, the way that I think every child needs to be. So the first reason that I feel really passionate about being a good mom to my brother is that I've experienced firsthand um, that yearning for your mom's support and presence and kind of the deep sadness that results from feeling that void. Um, so growing up, uh, my mom struggled with depression, pretty severe depression and bipolar disease. And that really impacted the way that she could be there for us. I know she tried her best and I don't, and I don't blame her because I know she really did everything that she could but she really wasn't there in the way that we kind of needed her. I, I felt her absence my entire teen years. Um, when I was in fifth grade, it became really bad. All of her instability kind of got so bad that she was unable to take care of us and let alone herself. Um, so fifth grade, we moved in with my dad. I was a 12 year old girl and things were starting to change and I was starting to become a woman and I felt really confused and and kind of lost. I would watch YouTube videos on how to do my makeup um, and I can't explain how hard it was to try to come up with an excuse when I needed to go to the store and buy tampons, but I didn't know how to say that to my dad. Um, so that was really hard for me and I think I resented that kind of that deprivation and I really feel that nobody should have to experience that. So I promised myself that I wouldn't allow my little brother to feel the same way. The second reason that I feel really passionate about this is because I saw the negative impact that my mom's absence had on my two older brothers. My two older brothers um, struggled a lot with drug and alcohol abuse when I was growing up and so that resulted in a lot of arrests and a lot of legal issues and it was really sad for all of us to watch. I always felt really lucky that I didn't allow my own frustration with her absence to manifest itself and bad behavior and like self-destructive um, habits, but I really was afraid that that would happen to my little brother too. I also saw the way my two um, older brothers kind of had this general idea that women were awful and they treated them with like animosity and disrespect. And that made me really sad because I felt, I felt that it's, it's just incredible how somebody could be affected by something like this by just not feeling supported and they could kind of carry that into their lives and let that affect every relationship that they have with people. So I really wanted to try to prevent that from happening to Fernando and I wanted him to feel so loved that he would have to respect himself and have to respect the people around him. And I thought if I was a good female role model for him, then maybe I could prevent that from happening. It's kind of hard to pinpoint everything that I've done to try to be his mom because it's been kind of a tough balance between being a cool sister and like a nice mom. Um, but I'll share with you a few of the actions that I've taken, kind of simple everyday things to try to be there for him. Um, one of the most basic things I started doing uh, when we first moved out of my mom's was that I just made sure he was fed. Um, my dad worked a lot, so I always kind of packed our lunches before school or make really simple dishes because I can't cook whatsoever. Um, and I mean, it was even as simple as like, teaching him that if you're making mac and cheese cup, you have to add water so you don't burn the house down. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I did was that I became really involved in his life and I tried to be involved in his academics, his 
um, his sports and his hobbies, so I went to as many football, soccer, <laughs> volleyball games as I could because he played every sport imaginable. Um, I would check his grades all throughout high school every week and kind of force him to turn in missing assignments if he didn't want to. And I always would take him out to dinner and reward him when he met his GPA goals. The third thing I did was that I always gave him advice on how to treat girls, and I really tried to encourage him to think about the way he would like me to be treated before he was an egotistical jerk to a girl. <laughs> in summary, I've told you uh, two reasons and three ways in which I've tried to fulfill the role model of mom for my little brother. Um, by this time, I hope that you all realize how extremely important this is to me. Every time I see my little brother do well, I feel more proud than I've ever felt myself when I accomplished anything. And although I feel really sad sometimes that my relationship with my mom wasn't the way I wanted it to be, I'm really, really grateful that I had the opportunity to shower my brother with love and hopefully have a positive impact on his life. Thank you. Thank you. 537. Thank you for respectfully waiting outside. Where are we? Here? Yeah. Here? I'm Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Zoe. Um, I think you're a really fluid and confident speaker, and um, I really admire you for sharing those stories and how strong you are throughout everything, and I thought your speech was really easy to follow. Thank you. Improvement. Hi, I'm Arazu. Hi, Arazu. I thought your speech was really uh, good. The only thing is I could feel your emotion, like you were about to break down and cry, which made me almost break down and cry. So I guess that's the only thing that, uh, which of course this is a very emotional speech, just like reigning in your emotion. Yeah. Talking. I think with practice that would have been better. <laughs> I don't think that's a bad thing. Okay, um... Rhonda, let's talk about your personal commitment speech. First off, it was very personal, which is what I was after, and I like that. You shared the fact that you didn't have a mother, that she was uh, mentally ill and had to go away. And uh, so you first felt her absence. Your first story was that you didn't have a mother, so you didn't have somebody to turn to, so you turn to YouTube, etc. And uh, that, that's very interesting. But it was a good story. It was poignant. Um, good storytelling. And um, I liked your moral at the end, which you said I wasn't going to allow the deprivation that I felt come to my brother. On your uh, second story, um, your brother's it's almost predictable, you know, with drug trouble and all that stuff, and their disgust towards <coughs> them, and they just are generalizing the absence of your mother. Um, and uh, you didn't want that happening to Fernando, so that was, you know, very wise on your part to try to break the pattern there, because the pattern could easily continue to repeat itself. Um, on your actions, yes, packing the lunch, uh, watching his grades, going to his sports, in other words, caring and, and giving him dinners and telling him how to treat women and so forth is, we're all good. Uh, your summary, your conclusion and tie back, we're, uh, we're all good and, um, uh, your only problem was you just went a little over time, that's all. So you needed to tighten this up, and I think, um, I don't know where, 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 where it's going to come, maybe in your first story, but uh, did you try timing it, or how'd that go? I honestly didn't have a chance to, so yeah. I think if I would have practiced it more, it would have like helped me to kind of be a little more composed and also um, have better pace. Now, were your goals here, remember the intro well, have more eye contact and start with the quote or attention grabber and you started with uh, the Emerson and uh, I was looking to see the Emerson come back men are what their mothers made them so you're being the mother to to Fernando it would have been a nice yeah. touch in the end how did the other uh, goals go I don't know about the eye contact because I think it was such an emotional speech that I felt like I couldn't really like I don't know, look around too much, or I would like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. 
But I think I really tried to. I tried to move a lot more. I don't know yeah. how that worked out. I guess I'll see in the video. Yeah. Um, my third goal was what? Sorry, I forgot. Uh, movement, eye contact, start with a quote or attention. Oh, well, grabber. I definitely tried to start with a quote. Um, Remember the intro really well. Yeah. Yeah, so you start on a first impression that's great. Yeah, and it was. It was a good first impression. I thought the emotion that was present in your delivery was really the glue that held our attention all the way through, so I thought it was powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Are you on deck? <laughs> Nope, I'm going right now. Patricia, okay, I see. That was Brianda, Patricia. Next will be Tiffany. Tiffany C. No more, no less. My nursing cohort faculty advisor, Dr. Halliman, said that sleep is important. Um, it helps give nutrients to your brain, and it helps you get re-energized for the next day. But I didn't believe any of this. I thought that I could go on my year and just do whatever I want, and I found this really detrimental. So today, I'm going to talk to you about my personal commitment to getting more sleep. Um, I will tell you two stories and three reasons, and I think you'll find this really interesting because I feel like as college kids, we don't really allot enough time to go to sleep, um, but we don't realize that it's really bad for our health. And so my first story stems back from high school. I had um, a boyfriend at the time, and we would talk all the time, including Skyping till 2 in the morning, when I had ASB and I had to get up at 6 in the morning to get to, class, to, get to school at 7. And what would happen is I just would get so worked up because I would have so much stuff that I needed to do that I would end up doing homework in ASB class and doing homework inside my class before it was due. And it was really bad for me, but I told myself that this, I worked well under pressure and that this was how I had to work. And I made that my excuse. And so after a year and a half, when um, my boyfriend at the time and I broke up, it was really hard for me because if you've ever been heartbroken, you know that it's very hard to go to sleep. And you either find yourself crying or you find yourself, when you do go to sleep, you're thinking about that person and then you wake up and it's not really true. And so for me, I would tire myself out the whole time just to find myself, I wouldn't even know what time I would go to sleep. And when I did this, I found comfort and solace in, in the night and I would learn to be more productive there. And so my second story is now presently in college, um, but a year ago, I, would t I took these habits into college. And by taking these habits into college, I found myself to be a night owl. But you know, college is super fun and I would hang out with my friends and I didn't allot enough time for classes. So I found myself during fifth week realizing how much work I had to do. And so going back to my, my motto, I, I thought that I would be able to do my work at night and be able to get all my work done. And so I would rush through and get my work done at night, not going to sleep, and then going to class the next morning. And my friends would actually get really worried about me. And they called me and they told me, hey, you need to get some sleep. And you know what I told them? I said, sleep is for the weak. I don't <laughs> sleep. And, but this really killed me in the end because I always felt so tired and so depressed because I would never get to hang out with them. I'd always be working alone at night with my lonely lamp, sitting there and trying to get my homework done. And, not being able to wake up for class in the morning. And so I realized that this had to change. I had to do something to change this. So I got all of the staying up late out of my system during the summer, and I said, I'm going to make a change during this second year of college. And so I took three actions to doing this. I decided that first, I would prioritize my schedule. If this meant going to um, do my homework a few days before, and so now, if my friends are like, hey, do you want to hang out? I'm like, sure, I finished all my homework, we can hang out all night, but I have to get some sleep. <laughs> the second thing that I've done is I've decided to sleep at least by 12 o'clock. So this gives me at least six hours of sleep, and I wake up in the morning, and I feel refreshed, 
and re-energized. And the third thing that I've done is that I've put away social media at least one hour before. Sometimes we find ourselves falling asleep, um, and before we go to bed, we decide to scroll through Instagram and get those last few likes in, last few retweets or favorites. And I realize that when I do this, I wake up and I don't feel as well rested as if I had just gone to sleep without it. And by doing this, I've realized that even though this semester or this quarter hasn't been over yet, I have felt so renewed and so refreshed, and I actually haven't been depressed because I'm staying up late doing my homework, I've been a lot more happy with myself and a lot more renewed and um, ready to get going with my day. And so I have given you two stories and three reasons as to why I'm personally committed to getting some sleep. And let me tell you, it's the best decision I've ever made. There should be no doubt in this room that I'm personally committed to getting more sleep. And I really believe that you should be too. I mean, sleep is the best thing that you can do. You're going to feel invigorated and re-energized just by prioritizing your schedule or going to sleep at 12 or putting your cell phone away. And so, like Mezu Barazani said, <laughs> your, your future depends on your dreams, so get some rest. And I'm taking those baby steps to get better and to be more successful by just simply getting some sleep. Thank you. Thank you. 4.54, we're somewhere over, somewhere over there. Hi, Angelica. Hi, Angelica. Trisha, I really liked your speech. You were, like, really energetic, and then, so I, like, really felt that what you said was important and it was really personally captivating. Um, I like that the layout of the speech was pretty easy to follow. And yeah, you have like, you have a nice clear voice. Thank you, Angelica. Improvement? Um, I thought it was a really great speech. Start with your name. Oh, hi, I'm Christine. <laughs> hi, Christine. I, I thought that your personal commitment was a good one. Um, I think, I thought your speech was great. Um, maybe looking more towards like, the entire room. I saw you like move towards each section, so I think that was great. But um, maybe like, Thank you for everyone's attention. That's good advice. Trish, let's talk about your speech. Uh, you started and ended with a quote. It would help to know who this author or expert was so we can qualify that. Um, yeah, uh, more and more <coughs> studies are really, you know, coming to the conclusion that you probably need seven hours sleep, not just six. But um, uh, people are really. Um, hurting themselves by not sleeping. So you had this fairly long introduction where you told us about your, uh, you know, lean, mean, non-sleeping machine, so that was cool, I guess. Uh, your setup was fine. Uh, you got into your first reason and you said it was told us about your boyfriend and Skyping all night and then something APS or ASP, what is that? ASP, um, it's Associated Student Body, it's like, it's like student government. So you, you had early student government and that's when you did your homework, is that is that what that initial stood for? Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, and so uh, you crammed everything in was the essence of your story and it wasn't, doesn't sound like a very happy time. Um, on your second story, you continued this in college until your friends sort of, I guess, had a, somewhat of an intervention and said, you know, you're really looking bad and you need to sleep. And uh, so, for some reason, we don't really learn exactly why. You just decided over the summer to change and to not go this way any longer, so that was good. You told us the three actions that you've taken, and they were all consistent with your um, philosophy to get more sleep. I think, too, that uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the social media, because I know that can be very stimulating and can be something that will wake you up and get you thinking about friends and people and liaisons, etc., you know. So... That was good. So your um, 
Summary, conclusion, and tie back, we're all fine. Let's see, where are your goals? Don't look up. Have more vocal variety and get tripped up over small phrases. How'd it go? Um, it was good. I when I like sometimes when I practice, I like get stuck on the way I, I want to say something. Yeah. And so I like freak out over it, like internally, even if it doesn't show. Um, so I try not to do that. And yeah, because you want to be extemporaneous. And then be um, last time I like didn't practice as much. So when I was watching the video, I realized I was looking up a lot, um, yeah. more than I like thought I had, and like. Nobody told me, so I was like, oh shoot, that's something I did. And so, uh, okay, I tried not to do that. Well, I'm glad you saw that in the video. You did a nice job today, Chris. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to Tiffany. Hi, Tiffany. How are you doing today? We're on red. We're on red. Yeah, that's not good. Okay, uh, I guess we better, yeah.